So as we continue in our Lenten sermon series called I Will, we're working our way through the vows that we hear every time someone is baptized in our church. So this week we're moving from looking inward to looking outward and answering the question, what does it mean to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Now, evil, injustice, and oppression can manifest itself in all kinds of different ways, in all kinds of different times. And as we heard when Susan shared the story of Jesus cleansing the temple, Jesus is standing up against injustice and evil and oppression in his time. At that point in time, the temple and the city were full of people who were there to celebrate the Passover feast, remembering when Moses led the people out of Egypt. You see, Jesus was about to complete the work of salvation and bring it out into the open where everyone could see it. And just like Moses, Jesus is working in an Egyptian, in an Egyptian-like setting, in the sense that the temple in Jerusalem at this point in time was a godless place, just like Egypt was. It was extravagantly conceived. It was ingeniously correct, uh, uh, constructed by a godless king by the name of Herod. And it was led by a godless high priest by the name of Caiaphas. And Jesus, Jesus needed to clear the deck, so to speak, so the people could see him for who he really was. So when he cleansed the temple, he drove out the oppressors. He drove out the imposters. He upset the routines and the accepted practices of the successful yet godless religion. And he spoke the words he needed to speak to establish the sovereignty of God fulfilled in himself as the savior, not in the temple. And the reason that this is so important is because they believed the temple was where God lived. And, and I love how one pastor put it. He said, as we read this story and as we see Jesus resisting evil and injustice and oppression that is going on in the temple, we're pretty quick to say, you go, Jesus, call them out, toss over the tables. We use it all the time to say, it's okay to get angry. Look, Jesus got angry, right? Like we're, we're on Jesus's side. However, if we stop for a second and actually let the story speak to us, he's cleaning out the temple. The temple is the church. He's not calling out Herod. He's not calling out the Roman government. He's calling out the people that are worshiping at the place he called his father's house when he was a child. The takeaway for them and the takeaway for us is that Jesus himself was the perfect temple of God. He actually said, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. The Jewish leaders did not like that. You know why? It took them 46 years to build the temple. But we know what Jesus said was true because history tells us when they crucified Jesus, he died. And what happened three days later? He rose again. He was the temple. That's all part of the great history of Christianity. But that begs the question, where does God live today? Well, the good news is, God lives in us. Now I'm not talking about the building here at 44 Highland Road that we're sitting in right now. I am talking about us, the believers who are inside this building, the believers that are worshiping with us online. That's where God lives. God lives in us as a body called the church. When Jesus lived on earth for those 33 years, he had a body. Guess what? He still has a body. It's called the church. 2 Corinthians 6.16 6, says, For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. God doesn't live inside the building. God lives inside the hearts of the people who are inside the building. God lives in the hearts of the people who gather together in a gymnasium, in a sanctuary, in a movie theater, outside under a tent. It isn't about the building. It's about the group of people worshiping together as the church. Why? Because God also lives, this, lives inside of me. God lives inside of you. God lives inside of us as individuals. So not only does God live inside of us collectively as a church body, God also dwells in us individually. 
Think about that for a second. If we embrace that truth, it has to change how we think about ourselves and it has to change how we think about others. If you have ever been in a worship service here before, you've probably heard me say, you never look at another person who Jesus didn't die for. How might that concept that Jesus died for everyone invite us to look inside of ourselves, to look inside of our beloved institutions for signs of evil, injustice, and oppression? Where do we see evil, injustice, and oppression at work in our world, in our community, in our institutions, in ourselves? All we gotta do is turn on the TV, right? All we gotta do is listen to the news. All we gotta do is listen to people have conversations with other people. So we see evil, injustice, and oppression at an all time high. The world looks like it's falling apart. And then we got this cloud over all of us of this us versus them mentality. And it's splitting our society and it's splitting our church. And I am here to tell you this morning, that has got to end. I mean, we are either for or against the police. We are either for or against the Republicans or the Democrats. We're either for or against CNN or Fox. We're either for or against the LGBTQ community or for or against people of color or for or against the United Methodist Church. Satan has caused people to think that if you agree with somebody who believes differently than you are, then you're automatically the enemy of that person. And if you ever decide to agree with somebody who agrees with you, then you're a sellout and you're canceled. That's the world we live in. In all seriousness, if we live with the motto that you never look at a person who Jesus didn't die for, how can we possibly live with the mentality of us versus them? How did Jesus treat people? He loved people. He never put parameters on his love, ever. He just loved people and we should do the same. So if we wanna overcome evil, injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves, we've gotta ask God to help us love God and to help us love others. And instead of first trying to find what makes us different, how about we first try to find what makes us the same? For example, we're all created in the image of God. We're all equally human. We all have dreams and aspirations. We all have pain and hurt. And we all have the responsibility to equally love God, which is a personal relationship with him, and love others, which is social justice. And then and only then will we begin to be able to overcome evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. But if we can't start by loving God and loving others, then evil, injustice, and oppression prevails before we even get started. And that is unacceptable. Amen? That is what we got to be about. That is why Christ Church's mission is building inclusive community, sharing Christ transforming love, because Christ's love is how you overcome evil, injustice, and oppression. The most life-changing truth I have ever experienced in my life is that I am a temple and God lives in me because of the relationship I have with Christ. That relationship with Jesus allows me to show love to others. That relationship is available to every single person. All you have to do is invite Christ in. Here's the deal. God with me, that's comforting. God for me, that's encouraging. God in me, that's transforming. And that's how we stop evil, injustice, and oppression. So where does God live today? He lives in the church. He lives in you and me, if we invite him in. And as we continue to yield control of our lives over to God, God's gonna keep our temple clean. God's gonna make us a house of prayer. God's gonna heal our hurts which will allow us together to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves and replace them by building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love. Hi, I'm Sean Lewis, and I'm the creative arts pastor here at Christ Church. Thanks for taking the time to connect with us for this short message. You can find the whole sermon from this week here on our YouTube page. You can also find our full service recordings from our live streams every week under the live tab. 
If you'd like to join us live on a Sunday morning, we stream contemporary worship at 9 a.m. Eastern Time and traditional worship at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time. To learn more about Christ Church and how you can join us in living into our mission of building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love, visit our website at ChristUMC.net.